Hi guys, welcome to another flip lecture for biology. Today we're going to be talking about microscopy. And that is a crazy word. What does that even mean? Basically it means using microscopes. Okay, so we're going to be talking about microscopes, um, their different parts, mm -hmm. how many different types of microscopes there are and when and um, if you would use them in a science experiment. Um, and then we're also going to talk about determining how to do a little bit of math, mm -hmm. how to determine the total magnification of a microscope, but we promise you that it won't be super painful. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. So the first thing that we want to talk about is some terminology. You guys know that biology really is a foreign language, and so in order to be successful in a biology class, you need to know what these new terms are. Okay, so the first term we're going to talk about is one we just mentioned, which is microscopy. Very nice. And microscopy is a technique you just use to increase the size of a specimen. So you guys know that in science, there are lots of things that exist in the natural world. They're all around us. They're on us. And we right. can't see them. Right, because they are microscopic. What does that, that prefix micro mean? It means really small. Right. So because it's so small, what we want to do is we want to be able to use a tool to be able to visualize things that are too small to be seen with the naked eye. Right. All right. Um, so when you make something bigger than its actual size, that process is called magnification. And that's a word we've all heard before. Yeah. And if you guys have ever tried to look at something and if it was a little too small, you probably pulled out something called a magnifying, magnifying glass. glass. And a magnifying glass just makes things bigger. Right. Really important term because obviously we need our scopes to make things bigger or larger for us. Now, the next term has to do with clarity of an image, how okay. clear an image is. Right, so that term is resolution. So, for example, depending on the quality of your phone, um, when you take pictures with your phone, they might be very clear, they might not be very clear. So, that issue of clarity is called resolution. Okay, so I have a question for you, Ms. Hines. Mm -hmm. If my microscope is really good at magnifying things, but it's really bad with resolution, can I use it? No, all you're going to see is a big, blurry picture. Okay, and what if my microscope had a crystal clear image, but the image was too small? That's also not going to help you. you got to fix both of these things. Yeah, so a good microscope, and this is mm -hmm. something that you guys need to know, a good microscope needs to have good magnification, but it also needs to have really good resolution. Right. All right, so let's dive in and see how we can use those terms in greater detail. So here's an example for us right now. We have two images. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we have our normal image at 10 times what you can see with the regular eye up at the top of the screen. And then we have that image where we're going to magnify it 45 times greater than what you can see with the naked eye. And you're starting to see that the image on the left and the right are starting to look distinctly different. Right. So our goal today is to figure out, based on those two terms that we talked about before, what is the difference between the image on the left and the image on the right? And there gives us some indication at the very top. So what does it say at the very top? So over here it says magnification alone. So again, I know magnification means to make things bigger. Mm -hmm. So what I see over here is that this picture has been made bigger, but that's it. They really haven't dealt with this other issue out there, which is resolution. Right. And so we said that in order for our microscopes to really be useful for us, not only does it have to make things bigger or magnify things, it also needs to make the image clear. So we need to make sure that we have good resolution. So if we look at these two images, we'll notice that the one on the left is large, but it's blurry. And the one on the right is large and clear. So the image that we always want to try to um, attain, what we're trying to get to when we're working with microscopes, we always want to make sure that our image is large, but also clear. So we're dealing with magnification and resolution. Right. All right. So now you're going to answer your first stop and jot question, and you're going to find some space on the side of your paper to answer this and still call your teacher over when you're finished answering it. So go ahead and pause the video and try to answer this question. Good luck. All right, the next thing that we need to talk about is how do we determine what the total magnification is of a microscope? So we need to do a little bit of math because we need to know how powerful a scope is to know whether or not we want to use it in a laboratory. Right, so actually our microscopes that we use have two different lenses inside them that magnify things. There are two places where things are being magnified. One place is up here. And what is this spot called on the microscope? That's the eyepiece. Okay. And another place where things are being magnified, where there are magnifying lenses, is down here in these magnifying lenses, which are called? The objective lenses. Okay. 
And so typically you have one eyepiece, but you will have many objective lenses. So you have some choices and, th and there's a range of magnification that you have available to you. Okay. And the way we talk about magnification in microscopes is we use something called power. So you'll th see things like this has a power of 10x. What does that mean if something has a power of 10x? It means that the what I'm looking at mm -hmm. um, is magnified 10 times greater than what I can see with my naked eye. Okay, so it's Assuming that I have good vision. Larger. Okay, so how do we calculate the total power or magnification of our microscope? All right, so in order to determine total power, we need to take those two lenses that we're talking about mm -hmm. and actually multiply them um, against one another in order to figure out what the total magnification power is when we're looking through both of those lenses at the same time. Okay, so we're going to multiply the power of the eyepiece times the power of the objective lens. That's right. Now, let's see what that actually looks like. So here's my eyepiece, and if you look at that eyepiece, you'll notice that it has a specific um, moniker or a specific piece of writing on it. And so what does that say, Ms. Hines? It says 10x. That's the part I want to pay attention to anyway. Okay. And typically, whenever we're trying to figure out what the total magnification is in a microscope, we can assume that the eyepiece mm -hmm. is always going to be 10x, unless we tell you otherwise. Okay. Uh, so there's my eyepiece, like we said before. Then we're going to have this next thing, and here we're focusing on our 10x, and we're going to be multiplying that by the next lens we're going to be looking through. And the next lens that we're going to be looking through is going to be our objective lens. And if you look, you'll notice that again, we have a certain number on mm -hmm. our objective lens. And in this case, it happens to be 40. It happens to be 40 times what I can see with the naked eye. So now I have my math problem pretty much set up. So I know that it's going to be 40 times 10 mm -hmm. because I'm going to multiply, whoops, I'm going to multiply my eyepiece times my objective lens. So in this case, it's going to be 40 times 10. And here's the great thing about doing any math when you're multiplying by 10. The great thing about doing math when you're multiplying by 10 is all you have to do is add a zero to the other number that you're multiplying by 10. So my eyepiece is 10, my objective lens is 40, my total magnification is going to be 400 because all I'm doing is adding another zero on the end of 40. Pretty simple stuff. Right. So what if it was, uh, what if my objective lens in this case happened to be 50? Hmm, all I gotta do is add a zero. My total for magnification is 500 in this case. So all we're doing is adding a zero, so you don't even need a calculator. That's the great thing about math with microscopes. It's pretty predictable stuff. All right, now that we've talked about that, here is another opportunity for you to demonstrate what you know. Another stop and jot, find room on the side of your paper and call your instructor over when you're done. Yet another stop and jot. We're giving you lots of opportunities to practice math here. So when you're done answering this stop and jot question, this one is a tricky trickster, mm -hmm. um, call your instructor over to see whether or not you answered the question correctly. So now we're going to talk about comparing powers of magnification. So what happens as I increase my power and as I zoom in more on my image? So for example here, I have two images of a bald eagle, one that's 7x or 7 times bigger, and one that's 10x or 10 times bigger. So what do you notice as you go from the 7 to the 10? Well, what I notice is that I'm seeing a lot more detail of that okay. particular um, organism, which happens to be a bald eagle. So we have a lot more detail, but that detail comes at a cost. Right, and the cost of that detail is that you cannot see as much of the field of view. So what does that mean? So if you look at our seven times uh, what you can see with the naked eye of the bald eagle, you'll notice that you're getting some of the sky behind it. You're mm -hmm. also getting not only the feathers on the head, but also some of the feathers on the body. So we're seeing a lot more of the eagle. But the problem there is, is that even though we're seeing more of it, we don't have any crisp understanding of, of the details of the bald eagle. So when we go up to a higher power, we're seeing more detail, but we're seeing less of the actual image. All right, here's another stop and jot. Make sure that you answer your questions on the side of your paper and call your teacher over when you think that you have the right answer. So now we're going to talk about the different types of microscopes. And there's three types that you need to know. We're going to run through them real quick, and you're going to write down the names of the scopes on each type of on your paper. All right, so our first type of microscope that we're going to be discussing is something called a 
dissecting, dissecting scope. Microscope. And we've heard this term dissecting before, right? Yeah, when you dissect stuff in the lab, you guys have probably dissected things in middle school like frogs and worms. Yeah, so a dissecting microscope has a very specific job. In fact, all of all three of these microscopes have a very specific job, and it's your um, this is your opportunity to learn when and where you would use which microscope in a laboratory setting. So let's talk about the dissecting scope in general. So in general, you're going to use the dissecting scope to look at something that you can already see with your naked eye. You just want to make it a little bit larger, easier to see. So for example, when you're dissecting and you're cutting into something, you can see that something without the microscope, but you want to make sure you're cutting in just the right place. So using a dissecting scope will make it just a little bit bigger, kind of like a magnifying glass to make it a little bit easier to make that cut in the right place. Yeah, and another great thing about dissecting scopes is that as you start moving up and um, looking at microscopes that have higher and higher magnification, um, you'll notice that the things that you get to look at have to be thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner. But one of the great things about a dissecting scope is that light doesn't have to pass through your specimen. It just has to bounce off of it. So you can stick your thumb underneath the dissecting scope. You can stick someone else's thumb underneath the dissecting scope. So you have lots of opportunities to look at things in greater detail that tend to be bigger, like bugs and um, snake skin and, and so on and so forth. Okay, the next type of microscope and the type we're going to use the most in this class and you're going to try and use today is something called a compound microscope. Um, compound microscopes are also sometimes called light microscopes. So if on your test you see the word light microscope, light and compound mean the same thing. And you know one of, one of the cruel jokes of our class of biology is that we have lots of different names for the same exact thing, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So compound microscopes are going to be used for a slightly different purpose. So compound microscopes are going to be the first microscopes that let you start to see stuff you really can't see with the naked eye. So for example, cells. Today yeah. you might get a chance to look at some cells under the microscope. Yeah, and so the unique thing about compound microscopes, if we're comparing them to the dissecting scope we just talked about, is in order for these guys to work, in order to actually see the image, the thing that you're looking at has to be thin enough for light to pass through it. So you're not going to be able to look at your thumb underneath a compound or a light microscope because no. what can't pass through your thumb, Ms. Hines? Light. So we're going to be looking at single layers of cells. We can look at fluids. We can look at um, single-celled organisms. All of those things are great specimen to be viewed underneath a light or compound scope. The last type of microscope, which is really cool, it's this huge thing in the picture here, is something called an electron microscope. And electron microscopes let us see things that are incredibly small, like the organelles or parts inside of cells that we cannot even see with the microscopes we have here. That's right. So things like that are really, really small, like viruses, virus Ooh. particles, those are excellent specimen to look at underneath a um, electron microscope. Now, electron microscopes, not only are they the most powerful mm -hmm. microscopes that exist to um, scientists, that exist in the laboratory, and allow you to see things that we could never have imagined even existed um, even 70 years ago. Uh, but the unique thing about uh, electron microscopes is that they use electrons and they don't use light. That's what makes them different from the dissecting scope, which uses light, but it mm -hmm. bounces light off of things, versus the light or compound microscope that shoots light through things. An electron microscope, instead of using light at all, we're just using electrons. Right. And the main thing that you just need to know is that this guy is the most powerful microscope available to us in the laboratory. Not to us, unfortunately. Yeah. but in other laboratories. Okay, so at this point you need to pause the video and find some space on the side of the paper to answer this stop and jot question. Call your teacher over when you're done. All right, one of the last things that we need to discuss really quickly is how to make something called a wet mount slide. And this is really important. This is all over your test, all over your quiz, all over the SOL. So we want to make sure that you understand the steps for actually making the specimen and putting it on a slide and putting it underneath a microscope so you can actually view the image well. Right. So the first step to making a wet mount slide is to get a clean slide and cover slip. All right. So we have a clean slide and a clean cover slip. 
After we have those two things, we want to carefully place our specimen on the glass slide, and that specimen can, specimen can be any number of things. And then this is a wet mount slide, so what we're going to add to that specimen is usually at least one drop of water. And then sometimes also, if the specimen is hard to see, if it's something that's kind of clear, what else can we add? We can also add something called a stain. And a okay. stain is just basically a chemical that does the same thing as like food coloring or dye. So to really um, allow contrast to appear when you're looking at it underneath the microscope. Step five, though, is probably the most important step. Right, Ms. Hines? Right. So when you put your cover slip on top of your specimen, you're going to put the cover slip on at a 45 degree angle, which is what's being shown in this picture at the bottom. Why do we do that? Well, we want to make sure that when we're looking at our specimen that there isn't anything compromising our field of view. Right. And unfortunately, because we're working with water, water and air, when they mix together, form something called... Air bubbles. Air bubbles. And when those air bubbles actually appear and you're looking at them underneath the microscope, that might be magnifying something 400 times what you can see with the eye or a thousand times what you can see with the eye. Those bubbles can completely compromise the specimen that you're trying to look at. Yeah, let's take a look at what bubbles can look like under the microscope. So here's a, an image in a microscope, and when you're looking, you might think, ooh, like these things that I'm seeing, they look like cells, or they look like the nucleus. They look really cool, but what are those things actually? Those are just air bubbles. This is an <laughs> awful slide. There's tons of air bubbles on so it. So what do you know they didn't do when they were preparing this wet mount slide? I know that they forgot to lower their cover slip at a 45 degree angle. Yeah, we want to always do 45 so that if there happens to be air bubbles, as we're lowering the cover Cover slip, we're pushing those air bubbles out the other side right. so that we don't have to worry about, well, is that an actual thing that I need to see or is that just trapped air underneath my cover slip? All right. Now, the very last thing that we need to do is just talk about the basic parts of the microscope. Now, fortunately, we've already talked about some of these things, mm -hmm. and we're hoping that you guys have had experience in middle school and also in elementary school um, with naming some of these parts. So we're just going to go through. You have the same picture on your notes. All we need you to do is to fill in what those parts are. Okay. So let's start from the top. So what is that very first thing that I'm going to put my eye on to That's look? where that first lens was. That was the eyepiece, which and remember? typically the eyepiece is? 10X. Really 10. important. All right, the next thing that we're going to talk about is something that actually spins that allows you to pick and choose what the second lens power is actually going to be. And because it spins, it's called the revolving nose piece. All right, and then attached to our revolving nose piece are the second lenses that we talked about when we were discussing the actual um, mathematical equation for determining total magnification of a microscope. And that's our objective lenses. Now, the objective lenses, there's usually three of them. Mm -hmm. The smallest one is usually called the low power objective lens. The middle one is called the medium power objective lens. I'm just going to abbreviate. And mm -hmm. then the biggest one is called the high power, and that's going to be the one that magnifies things the most. So usually when you're focusing a microscope, you always want to start off with the least magnification and then work your way up. Exactly. All right, our next thing is something that's going to actually hold our specimen in place so it doesn't shift. And that thing is called a stage clip. And the reason it's called that is because the place that it holds the specimen is called the stage. stage. So the stage clip holds the specimen on the stage that it, so it makes sure that it's not moving anywhere when you're trying to visualize it through um, the actual eyepiece uh, on your microscope. The next thing is very important. It's something called a diaphragm. And a diaphragm has a really important job. Yeah, the diaphragm controls how much light passes through to your specimen. And it can be a problem if you have too little light, and it can also be a problem if you have too much light. When you look through, it'll just be like blinding. It's so much light. And so if you notice that when you look through your microscope today, you're going to want to check out your diaphragm. All right, our next thing is going to be the very first thing really we're going to be fiddling with mm -hmm. once we actually get our specimen on the scope. And that's something called the coarse adjustment knob. And you should be able to tell the difference between the coarse adjustment knob um, and the other knobs that might be on your microscope. It's because it's always going to be the biggest one. Right. Now our next thing, this is a light or a compound microscope, which means that we actually have to have a source of 
light. There we go. So we have our light source on our microscope. The next thing, after we use our course adjustment, if we're really trying to fine tune the image to really work on resolution to make it as clear as possible, mm -hmm. we're going to use the fine adjustment, which is smaller. Okay. And we do have to warn you about one thing. Mm -hmm. On this particular microscope picture, the fine and the coarse adjustment are separate from one another. But on some of the microscopes that you may use in lab today, sometimes the, fine, the coarse and fine adjustment are located one right on top of each other. So there'll be two knobs and the outer one will be the coarse and then the inner one will be the fine. So make sure you know the difference between the two. And then the very last part of the microscope that you are responsible for knowing is the base. Base. And you want to make sure that you know the base. Base is important. It supports the microscope. Um, but you do need to make sure that you go back and you look over all the parts of the scope because they will be fair game for a quiz or a test in the future. Okay. Thanks, guys.